Now, as presented previously, the era of five good emperors was brought to an end by the reign of Commodus, the son of Marcus Aurelius. And he became paranoid, he slipped into insanity, and he was murdered in the year 192. Now, as the textbook emphasizes, the central government fell into the hands of military usurpers for almost a century. Agriculture became dominated by large estates that were relying on slavery for the maintenance of their wealth. Germanic tribes that had been kept outside the borders of the empire began to make incursions into Roman territory. The Germanic problem forced higher and higher taxes as it cost more to fund and equip a large army to protect the borders. In the West, civil wars amongst generals reduced urban centers to poverty and ashes, strangling commerce in its wake. Trade and small industry declined, and the wealth of the empire in the West disappeared. Meanwhile, in the East, untouched by these conflicts, the opposite took place. Economies flourished along with art and literature. So between 192 and 235 reigned the Severan dynasty. And as I shared with you earlier, Septimius Severus was the first of the dynasty. He cultivated the army's support and su substituted equestrian officers for senators in key administrative positions. His son, Caracalla, extended full Roman citizenship to all free inhabitants of the empire. And increasingly unstable and autocratic, Caracalla was assassinated by Macrinus, who succeeded him, and before being assassinated and succeeded by Elagaga. Okay, here, let me see if I can try it again. Elagabalus. Alexander Severus, the last of the Severan dynasty, couldn't control the army and will be assassinated in 235. And it was his death that marked the end of the Roman peace or the Pax Romana. So please read the textbook to find out about the infamous age of the barracks emperors or the crisis, of, or what is known by historians as the crisis of the third century, which is the commonly applied name for the crumbling and near collapse of the empire. Now between 235 and 284, 25 emperors reigned, 18 of them who died by violence. Now ordinary citizens suffered as a respect for imperial authority disappeared in force, Bribery and corruption became commonplace. The period of extreme military, political, and economic crises ended with the accession of Diocletian, who reigned from 284 until 305. Now, Diocletian was aware of the fall in both power and prestige of his office. And unlike Augustus, he did not cloak his power behind a thin veil of republicanism but ruled in the style of an Eastern king, wearing diadems, purple robes, appearing aloof, and demanding acts of obeisance. Now, much of this was done to distance himself from the troops who had used their familiarity with the previous emperors to increase their personal gain at the expense of the empire. He also saw the flaw within the Roman system of succession and attempted to rectify it by means of a radical new system in which the empire was split in half, with each half governed by an Augustus, who appointed his heir to the rank of Caesar. Thus, the new emperor would gain valuable experience and succession would not be questioned. In doing so, he effectively created what would become the Western Roman Empire and the Eastern Roman Empire. And in 293, as each Augustus took a junior emperor called a Caesar, to provide a line of succession, the new policy constituted what is now known as the Tetrarchy, or the Rule of Four. Diocletian pushed economic reforms, including price and wage controls, and increased the tax burden. Diocletius also separated the military from civilian chains of command to reduce the probability of armies making or unmaking emperors. He also put a physical distance between himself and the Senate by moving the administrative capital from Rome to Turkey. To him, these attempts were the best chances of survival. And historians write that the transitions of this period mark the beginnings of late antiquity. Diocletian's successor, Constantius Chlorus, 
could not deal with the insurmountable problems, and upon his death in 306, the Tetrarchy effectively collapsed. Constatius' troops immediately proclaimed his son, Constantine the Great, as Augustus. A series of civil wars erupted, which ended with the entire empire being united under Constantine, hence his title, the Great. As he consolidated his rule over the empire, he constructed a new capital city in the Eastern Roman Empire, naming it after himself, Constantinople. He chose a strategic position that was defensible by both sea and land, and in time, Constantinople became the largest city in the remaining empire, where Greek, not Latin, was the dominant language and culture. Now let's take a look at religion. The Roman state religion worshiped the emperor as divine and maintained respect for its roots in the environment and cosmos. Romans believed certain rituals made them right with the supernatural. It was every Roman citizen's duty to perform the appropriate rituals to ensure peace and prosperity. And as the, Romans, as the Roman Empire expanded and came to include people from a variety of cultures, the worship of an ever-increasing number of deities was tolerated and accepted. Other religions from Persia, Greece, and Africa flooded Rome after the conquest. And to be accepted by the Romans, the other religions needed only to perform the prescribed rituals at the appropriate times. They were required to observe and include sacrifices to the divine emperors first as a declaration of loyalty to the empire. So this could be easily accepted by other faiths as Roman liturgy, liturgy and ceremonies were frequently tailored to fit local culture and identity. An individual could attend to both the Roman deity representing his Roman identity and his own personal faith, which was considered part of his personal identity. In an effort to enhance loyalty, the inhabitants of the empire were called to participate in the imperial cult by revering the emperor first, and of course, members of the royal family. They were all divine or godlike. The cult complex became one of the focal points of life in the Roman cities. The deification of the emperor and the royal family always occurred next to a temple, a theater or amphitheater for gladiator displays, for other games, and of course at public bath complexes. Now under Roman rule, Jewish people of Judea were allowed a degree of religious freedom and self-rule. And in the first century BC, Julius Caesar <coughs> excuse me, granted Jews the freedom to worship in Rome as a reward for their help in Alexandria. So while Judaism was accepted, it was on occasion subject to local persecution. Judaism is characterized by a passion for meaning, followed by strict observance and practice. In God, mortals, deities, and the unknown or the other are intuited as one. In creation, everything is good and one must live life fully. In human existence, one must make way for the image of God. In history, God intervenes so people must be socially active, politically responsible, and economically just. In morality, force, wealth, sex, and speech must be regulated, while murder, adultery, stealing, and false witness were not tolerated. In justice, Judaism entertained prophets who periodically came to warn people to establish justice or be destroyed. In suffering, Judaism maintained passion for freedom and justice. And finally, in Messianism, there was God intuited as one and a messenger creating hope for political freedom, moral perfection, and earthly bliss for the human race. So to be Jewish, <clears throat> observance and practice <clears throat> included the importance of ritual to instill piety, respect for tradition, which meant observance of the Torah or the law, revelation meant disclosure, the covenant relations re reveals God's power, goodness, and concern. So to be the chosen people meant not national arrogance, but a prophetic protest 
against social injustice. So by 6 BCE, the Romans <clears throat> became afraid of, of Judaism. They sent a procurator to rule the nation of Judea, revoking self-rule. And this caused widespread unrest and sent several groups underground. The Sadducees favored cooperation with the Romans, emphasizing assimilation. The Essenics, or the Essenes, preferred adaptation and accommodation, balancing the demands of the Roman world with their rich heritage. They awaited a Messiah for deliverance from Roman rule. And meanwhile, a radical revolutionary sect known as the Zealots wanted a violent overthrow of Roman rule immediately. Now, less than a generation after the Roman conquest of Judea, a man named Jesus of Nazareth was born. A carpenter by trade, Jesus preached for a short period during which time he spread a new message. To transform the inner person, one must love your neighbor as yourself. This was radical during a time of increasing accumulation of wealth and power in the Roman Empire. And that Jesus was well received by Jewish commoners, but the priesthood wanted him silenced. Banditry under the flag of Jewish nationalism was frequent, and there was open talk of rebellion and a hope for the promised Messiah who would restore Jewish rule over Israel. Into this political background, Jesus came forward teaching what appeared to be a radical form of Pharisee and zealot doctrine through his ascetic emphasis on the ethical requirements of the law and his belief in life after death and in the coming of the kingdom of God. Foremost of these radical beliefs was his insistence on obeying the spirit of the law rather than the letter of the law. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Give to God what is God's. This angered the Sadducees, who believed in the direct interpretation of the law and who just so happened to have political power over the province and the most contact with the Roman forces. However, Jesus was not just a radical, but a revolutionary, because he went further by challenging Jewish traditions as the Sabbath, undermining obligatory Jewish law. Most controversial was his claim to be the promised Messiah who would deliver Israel from her enemies. Now, while his followers later interpreted the deliverance to be a spiritual one, authorities and religious leaders viewed this as a physical deliverance and a political deliverance from Roman occupation. So when he entered the temple at Jerusalem and attacked the money changers, religious leaders had him arrested, fearing his ability to stir the crowds against them. And basically, his, his statement that the poor shall inherit the kingdom of God over the rich, that is very challenging. You don't tell rich people that they're not getting to heaven. So Pontius Pilate is going to make an example of him by having him crucified. And crucifixion, this is a penalty for those um, judges or those who are judged as guilty of sedition against Rome. Crucifixion. Get out of here. Now many of Jesus' followers believed he rose from the dead and was the Messiah, the Savior of Israel. Inspired by this belief, now called Christianity, his followers spread Jesus' teaching, teachings throughout the Roman Empire. The theological contributions of Jesus and his teachings were unique and profound, and two leaders emerged during the early Christian movement. Simon Peter, who became the first bishop of Rome, and Saul of Tarsus, later known as St. Paul, an early persecutor of Christians. As St. Peter exclaimed Jesus as the Son of God, or Christ. But St. Paul cleared the way for non-Jews to be converted to Christianity. St. Paul set the stage for the conversion of the Roman Empire. His letters form a major portion of the New Testament of the Bible. 
Paul's role in his fundamental reorientation from Stoic philosophy to Messianic faith transformed Christianity into a religious movement for both Jews and Gentiles. Now, groups of people in Greek society had always congregated around Jewish communities, revered them for their concept of one God or monotheism, and modeled their lives after Jewish standards but they did not subscribe to all of the tenets of Judaism, such as circumcision. But Christianity gave Greeks an excellent alternative. Christianity's communal aspect was attractive to all poor people throughout the empire. Women were especially attracted since they achieved relatively high ranks in the new religion. The promise of salvation was extremely important given the crisis of the third century, as converts increased during the same period. So the success of Christianity was founded on the universal message of the religion, of its leadership, and of the social conditions of the Mediterranean world at the time, hence why I wear this t-shirt. Romans, for the first two centuries, believed Christianity was a Jewish sect rather than a separate religion. They saw Christianity's intolerance as a threat to religious peace. Christians refused to perform the Roman state religious rituals. Christians were persecuted and suffered as a result, especially through death by crucifixion or death through sport. Lions devouring Christians became a favorite Roman pastime. Persecutions are going to reach their peak under emperors Nero, and Diocletian. Historian Tacitus reports that after the great fire of Rome in the year 64, Nero diffused blame by targeting Christians. And historians Eusebius and Lactantius document the last and most vicious persecutions occurred under Diocletian. So when Constantine the Great became emperor, the majority of citizens in the Roman Empire had converted to Christianity. And as he united the entire empire, Constantine legalized Christianity definitively in 323 through the Edict of Milan. And this provided religious or official tolerance of the religion. Constantine will later convert to the faith. So given official tolerance, Christianity became unstoppable. The textbook provides you a succinct reading on canon law, the doctrine of Petrine succession, and the title of Pope. As disputes in theory arose, Emperor Constantine ingeniously sponsored an ecumenical convention known as the Council of Nicaea, which was held in Turkey in 325. Now the council adopted an important doctrine for the faith known as the Nicene Creed. There is only one God who is experienced as three persons, also known as the Trinity. And these three persons are God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The Nicene Creed also established the principle of one holy, Catholic, and apostolic faith, one with creation, holy in the belief of the Trinity, Catholic in being universal with Jesus' love, and apostolic in living Jesus' life fully. Official Roman Christianity created obedient subjects for imperialist endeavors. But most importantly, what is most controversial is the Council of Nicaea creatively absolved the Roman Empire from its responsibility for Jesus' death. Pontius Pilate washed his hands from all accountability, laying blame for crucifying Jesus on the Jews themselves, not Roman administration. This historical revisionism not only allowed all Roman citizens to accept a faith whose God was destroyed by its own government, but it set the stage for blaming Jews throughout all of Christian history. Jews will be blamed for Jesus' death, not the Romans. In 395, 
Emperor Theodosius the Great adopted Christianity as the official religion of the Roman Empire. And this was great for the remaining Roman Empire. The division of the Roman Empire into a Latin West and a Greek East <clears throat> foreshadowed the division of Christianity between Catholicism and Orthodoxy. And this will be complete by the 11th century. Now, the Latin church centered in Rome inherited the territorial organization of the late Roman Empire into dioceses. Emperor Constantine's adoption of Christianity was part of his strategy to present himself as God's appointed ruler on earth, an ideology of political legitimization that dominated the Western world for the next 13 to 1400 years of European history. Numerous groups from the plains of Asia, united under Attila the Hun, migrated west, pushing German Visigoths into Roman territory. By 410, the Visigoths invaded the Italian peninsula and sacked Rome, sending shockwaves throughout the empire. In 455, the Vandals invaded Rome from the west and sacked Rome. And finally, in 476, Germanic groups deposed the last emperor, Romulus Augustus. So historians point to multiple causes of the collapse of the Roman Empire in the West. The civil wars over the imperial succession, the financial cost of supporting the military, and the resulting tax burden on the peasantry and local officials provide important clues for the collapse. The barbarian invasions and the empire's resort to the recruitment of those same forces seriously damaged Roman agriculture, which was the base of entire society. The emperors responded to financial crisis by depreciating the currency, leading to inflation, which forced the collection of taxes in kind. And after the invasion of 476, regional and local system of exchange continued, but the long-distance trade in bulk and luxury goods that was present uh, only was maintained in the East, not in the West. Standards of craftsmanship in pottery making and ceramics declined, as did the standards of living for those in the Western half of the empire. Roman tax systems survived, but the revenues now went into the purses of the warlords rather than the emperor. Roman administrative and legal systems continued, but with a different administrative elite. Agricultural patterns continued, the aristocrats dominated civil life, and they dominated the cities surrounding, in the surrounding regions. You know, Roman culture and Roman church continued to be very powerful aspects of society, but only on the peninsula. And what happened in essence was society was beheaded with the top layers of society replaced by a new ruling class. Now, the average farmer's life was changed little because every Every system needs a continuation of the direct producers, which are the agricultural workers. However, uh, the entertainment industry suffered tremendously. With Christianity becoming official, gladiatorial contests, chariot racing, the lascivious, cruel, bloodthirsty, and extravagant consumption that was previously used as forms of social control to divert the population's attention away from the obscene accumulation of wealth by the aristocracy, were not only unpopular, but no longer financially feasible. Christianity changed that picture. The admiration for the pomp and glory of the past was accompanied by an abhorrence of the decadence and characterized the end. So, you are now ready for a documentary that follows this presentation. Mm -hmm.